Okay, so my goal is that today we will understand some basic principles how cryptography is used in Bitcoin. So if you see then some other cryptocurrency, you will understand how it actually works, even if some functions or some algorithms are changed, because everything is very similar inside. So, about, short about me. So, yeah, I took PhD in information security. My work was connected to public infrastructures. That's actually very close to Bitcoin concepts. Uh, also, I was a software engineer and I managed like, projects for five plus five years. So, I'm still a partner in a software sourcing company by deal in Ukraine. Our agenda will first look which myths are in cryptography exist, how people actually understand it uh, from a general perspective. Uh, we will see how Bitcoin actually use cryptography to operate. We will look on general concepts of uh, cryptographic operations and then review some principles of uh, mainstream crypto algorithms. And at the end we will, if somebody survives, <laughs> uh, we will speak a bit about math. So about number theory, about elliptic curves, and so on and so forth. And also, I think we will have two small breaks for questions and for the majority, well, two breaks for five minutes. Okay, so uh, tell me what normal person think when he hears about cryptography? What's the first? Appears in your mind when you hear Cyprus. it. Cyprus. Right, that's actually it is. So <laughs> most people think about ciphers when you hear about cryptography. But actually, cryptography and information security itself is far bigger than ciphers. So information security is a state of information. Uh, in which the certain properties are preserved and ensured. And these properties are mostly about confidentiality, integrity, availability, and plus, of course, non repudiation. So, when we ensure confidentiality, we say that information would be accessed only by authorized users. Only the user who has private has a key can read the information. Nobody else. When we speak about integrity, we mean that information that being created couldn't be modified without uh, any without being noticed. So that's like how digital signatures. Uh, work. So if you sign some message, nobody can change it without being noticed. Also, availability is mostly not about cryptography, it's mostly about uh, like DDoS attacks. So if some information uh, resource or website uh, couldn't be accessed, so it doesn't matter how valuable information inside, no access. No matter how secure it is. And the last non repudiation is means that if me as a user uh, created some message and signed it, then later I cannot reject that I was the author of it uh, and I own this message. And uh, in information security, there are different types of algorithms that provides, that ensures these features, these uh, properties of information. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's uh, go to the myths. They're quite common. So, 
or the first. Uh, if you see some advertisement, some commercial about some system, and you see people talk about that this system 100% secure, don't worry, that's not true. Every system has flaws. Even like computer, there is a proverb that if there is a computer in a metal case under 100 meters inside the earth, uh, unplugged from electricity, then I still have doubts about its security. <laughs> <laughs> and that's right. No doubts. So that's about uh, like cold storages. So um, if you hear that some cold storage is like 100% secure, yeah, that's okay. It could be 1999, not 100%. Uh, it's very hard to measure security unless something happens. So you cannot, it's very hard to measure. That's the main thing. So the next, is if somebody like says that my system is more secure because we use longer keys, whatever, biggest walls, that's that's also the myth because hackers don't break the strongest part. They don't usually break mess. They break some weakest chains in the whole system. So they break, uh, they uh, have attack on implementation or incorrect usage of protocols, whatever. So uh, like encryption, it's not, it's only one small part of the whole system. Third one is that a lot of companies, they pretend that system is so secure and it's so seamless so user shouldn't any shouldn't even think about it you just can use press buttons and receive some results it's also not true um, security means inconvenience always so uh, it's very hard to convince uh, users uh, to use the system in correct way and um, they usually like convenience, they like simple. They like when everything is done in one click. But that's not the case. That security need, uh, requires awareness and responsibility. And also, we can put equal sign between security and education. That's what happened with a lot of Bitcoins Bitcoin users, when they lost their wallets, lost their money, because they just don't understand how it works. The fourth myth is that I can, whatever, can create my own encryption, my own algorithm, and use it. That's also not true. It's very hard to create something new in security. So, common approach now is to create like open source algorithms, open source software, so a lot of people can check it and like, correct it if needed. Uh, even in U US, uh, when created uh, advanced encryption standard, IES, uh, published it, uh, so photographers from all over the world can check it. And that's a very wise approach. If you try to protect your algorithm, Hackers will come and uh, do reverse engineering, and they will find some flaw in your system. <coughs> so in the face, yeah, if you cannot like, ensure 100%, why should you spend money? It's always about money. So uh, there is a general principle that if cost of attack is bigger than gain from its success, you don't. Nobody will spend uh, money on. Uh, Time. So if you protect your one million of doors and to, to break the wall, uh, hackers should spend two, bi two millions, they will not do it. So it's always like a balance between security and cost. Okay, and the like, last statement, very connected to Bitcoin. So every system, when it's created, it should be an ex explicit statement uh, what kind of services this system provides in terms of security. Is it uh, 
and potentiality, integrity, or liability, or something else. Because otherwise, people will treat any accident connected to this system as, as it's broken. So imagine, um, when some exchange, Bitcoin exchange, uh, was hacked, what, what actually uh, happens with uh, Bitcoin exchange rate? It goes down. But have you heard any stories that when some <coughs> robbers um, made, made theft from the bank vault, so gold price go down? No. no. It, and it leads for a like, principle. Uh, if somebody stole this wallet, it doesn't mean that Bitcoin is insecure. It meant that user didn't care about his wallet. That's all. So it just, in Bitcoin protocol, it's like it was open source, so nobody uh, made like an implicit, explicit statement. Okay, we ensure this, this, and this in this protocol. And we don't care about this and this. So for example, Bitcoin is protected for from forging of coins. It, there are some algorithms that ensure authenticity of sender and recipient, um, but nobody like tries to break the cryptography. Hackers they use non-uniform uh, <coughs> message spread to do double spending, so they they don't break security. They um, try to replace public users' public key, so when in the middle attack would be possible. And they try to find some flaws into a generation algorithm, like a recent Android problem when it was found that the keys wallets generated on Android phone were weak, were weak, so hackers actually could stall a lot of money from these wallets. So let's go to the what actually Bitcoin uses. So it's every yeah, it's about perception. Lack of education means some specific perception of these problems. So if people will be, be more if people be more educated, they will understand it better and Bitcoin will like cryptocurrency will not be so volatile. So Bitcoin uses digital signatures, hash functions, key distribution, time consuming operations. It's also about cryptography. It uses encryption and key generation. Um, before we will come to this primitives, crypto algorithms, we will um, see general concepts how cryptography, how information security is actually great. Like, and general concepts are one-way functions. It's dolly yao principle. It's some information probability and entropy, and it's complexity theory. One-way functions. That's hard to maybe to understand from the first perspective, but it's very easy to, to see on the example. Imagine that you have a glass, and you put it on like break on the floor. You cannot, it's very easy to do, but reverse operation to create, to retrieve glass from pieces of actually pieces, it's very hard. That's how uh, one-way functions <coughs> work. If you have some x, integer x, it's very easy to compute a function from this. But it's very, <coughs> it's impossible to find initial value from the result. And the whole existence of cryptographic system lies in the existence of one-way functions. No, no one-way functions, no cryptography at all. So, and there, uh, there are some other simple examples. It's very, usually it's much easier to multiply numbers than to find, like, to solve factorial problem number or some number of um, multipliers and very easy to
square some number, then to make square root from the result. The second, it's Dolet Yao principle. Uh, this, like a general principle about uh, <coughs> information systems, and uh, it states that attacker control controls the whole information system except some small parts. So, attacker is he can obtain any message passing through the network. He is a user uh, of this network, so he can the same he has the same rights, and he can say send and receive messages from any users or impersonate users. But attacker, so he controls all network. Uh, but attacker cannot uh, guess a random number from like very large space. Under large, I mean uh, very large. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like two uh, in a square of 128. If you imagine the whole universe, and you, if you calculate the whole atom, atoms in the universe, it will be number like two in 80th degree. But the shortest key in cryptographic system uh, is taken from the space to uh, squaring 128 <coughs> degrees. So it's enormous. Uh, like variety of choice, it's very hard to to guess. Without correct key, attacker cannot decrypt messages. That's uh, he cannot find private key from public key, and he cannot control he cannot memory of offline computer users of offline computer. That's what we can ensure. So it's the system ensures this. Also. Uh, the last uh, big concept is about entropy. Entropy is an uh, amount of information uh, that each source has. So I don't have a flip chart, but I'll try to explain. Uh, if you have a normal language, for example, and you need to guess some letter, you have letter B, then U, then probably the next will be S. So you can guess, you can you can solve crosswords, but if you you cannot guess uh, so easily private key because it's random, it's totally random. So all natural languages they have uh, low entropy. That this leads to that you can actually archive, archive uh, the sentences. You can archive texts like from 70 percent. It means that natural languages they have redundancy, and it's very important in the information security is that uh, keys that some information should be similar to a uniform distribution from a, from a very large like, space. The first picture shows uniform distribution of some function, and the second is like normal distribution. So if your key generation algorithm, when you generate your wallet, works like the second case, attacker can guess uh, your key with much higher probability. Okay, and the last thing is complexity. Complexity is like can be expressed through the number of operations needed to perform some algorithm. <coughs> and each operation consumes processor time. <coughs> so if you select the right algorithm, you can create actually a piece of work like proof of work in the Bitcoin protocol, and it will consume some particular time. You can actually adjust 
and how hard is the task, how much time a normal user will spend to solve. And there are some different levels of complexity. They are mostly uh, defined through all notation. And they're expressed in um, mathematical functions. So very easy problems like uh, understand uh, is the number even or odd. It's like the simplest. It has contact, uh, constant complexity. If uh, you need to search through the unsorted uh, array, some you have to find some uh, element in unsorted array, the complexity will be O from N. It will be linear. If you have to solve the uh, traveling salesman problem, so it will be factorial complexity. So it's really various from from different uh, applications, from different algorithms. So mostly uh, cryptographic one by functions, they based on the problems that could be solved only with factorial or exponential complexity. You really cannot solve it effectively. But all operations like encryption, decryption, signing, they are based on like linear or quadratic uh, complexity. So it's easy to, for a computer to like, calculate signatures or encrypt text. Okay, and here the like lines they are displaying how fast complexity grows uh, from lengths of like message from lengths of key or whatever. Okay, I suggest to have small break and yeah. Every time you need to protect your information, you have to follow like your process. Initially you create a key, you generate a key, then you distribute this key, then you encrypt, you use hash functions, and you sign this digital signature. So we will start from key generation. I drank a bit beer, so I'll be faster, <laughs> more fun, I know. Come on, Apple. I have some messages, some messages. That's my computer, okay. Um, so, key generation is the process of generate good random keys. It's very important to generate the, the keys from uniform space, uniform distribution. And the basic formula for any key is some seed data, some random data, plus cryptographic operation, like hash or encryption, and you will receive your key. The principle is that your seed data should be truly random. It's very hard to achieve. Um, almost no computers uh, have real random data, like the data source. And so there are different kinds of random numbers generators. Um, it's truly random number generation. Uh, the seed, the seed value is based on a natural entropy. It's some atmosphere noise. It's thermal noise. It's some quantum effects. Something that you really cannot um, repeat. This situation will never happen again. Normal computers, they have pseudo-random uh, number generators. The seed value is some calculated value from some formula or whatever, and you can uh, restart it and repeat it. So if you start, yeah, if developers are present, you know that every time you start your application which um, uses some random numbers, you can do that every time they will be the same. So you can test your application and track behavior. So for cryptographic usage for Bitcoin wallets generation, you have to use cryptographic uh, pseudo-random random generators. In, uh, some, in languages like Java, .NET, there are specific functions to generate numbers that are very close to random. The main property of these generators are the distribution of the results of the keys are uh, uniformly distributed. For pseudo-random generators, they are like normal distribution, and attacker can guess can guess 
your key because key space is like much less than and it should be. Okay, you generated the key, so now you have to distribute it. It's a process of secure exchanging of keys between two sides of communication. So if I need to send a message to Aliona, then I need to, to send here my key. In, in case of symmetric cryptography, we have to have the same key to communicate. So it could be done using earlier distributed key, so we can encrypt our channel and send the key, or we can uh, have a face-to-face -face meeting and set, just give it on a piece of paper, or we can use trusted party, some third party. In public key cryptography, uh, which is used in Bitcoin, user generates two keys. It's private key and public key. And public key is supposed to send to the public. But there is a big issue with public key cryptography. Um, and it's built a lot of infrastructures around it. It's man-in-the-middle attack. So as you see on the picture, that if I send some key to the public, that somebody can substitute it and uh, he will impersonate me somehow. So in Bitcoin case, uh, if I am an owner of some internet shop, I can put my Bitcoin wallet on a website. And hackers can break my site and put their wallet. Only one small change. So everybody who pays me money will pay them. Will pay to the attacker. And I will I will not notify it um, unless like I will like check my book. So Bitcoin doesn't address this problem at all. So it's to the uh, knowledge and it's to the user. The user has to protect his public key and like keep it uh, secure. It's usually done by a public key infrastructure in normal world, in banking and some similar stuff. Okay, encryption. Encryption is a process of transforming some piece of information, message, and it forms that nobody can guess what is inside. Usually it's done by a key. But encryption can protect only confidentiality. Not integrity, not non repudiation nothing. And main principles is that without a key, um, the super cipher test text doesn't provide any information about message. That should be enforced. And even if the same message was encrypted twice, the same message, the cipher text should be different. Uh, it's usually done by adding some random data uh, to the beginning of the message. And each message split it to like set of blocks. So, and each block is dependent from the previous block. So, if you change some some small part of the message, uh, all message will be changed. All cipher text will be changed. And the cipher text and the message together, they don't, they they shouldn't provide any information about the key, because attacker always have access to the algorithm. And for a symmetric cryptographic case, which is Bitcoin, uh, it should be impossible to obtain private key from the public key. That's how it works. Okay, hash. Hash is some function uh, which maps a message, arbitrary length, to the fixed one. Very short from user's perspective. It's usually like 120 8 bits, 256 bits, very short message. <coughs> and uh, hash functions are used to obtain like a digital fingerprint of a message, unique digital fingerprints. 
And principles are that for any input X or message, the output should be similar to a uniform binary string. So usually space of messages is quite mm, small. And space of um, possible hashes is very big because they are randomly, they are uniformly distributed. <laughs> it's a very big space. Uh, and good hash does it. And the second, it's impossible to find two messages. Uh, so the hashes uh, will do the same. Hash function should do the same. And from hash function, it's, it's impossible to find a message. And uh, here is this picture how it works. So usually hash function uh, uses encryption, but instead of adding blocks of concatenating blocks, it just uh, adding it to the, each other. So these operations are Hashes are very common in uh, digital signatures and yeah, a lot of graph preparations. So digital signature is a fully analog of handwritten signature. It's some block of information that is added to the original document by author and it demonstrates the authenticity of um, a message. So digital signature is designed to protect integrity and non-repudiation. Only these properties of information. A digital signature usually consists of two parts, signing and verifying. So, and principles are, so even a small change in a message or signature leads to rejecting signature during its verifying. It's in, impossible to create two signatures, two different messages, which produce uh, the same signature. And um, impo impossible to create a signature without knowing a private key. And usually length of the signature uh, is the same as length of the private key, or it could be double or but it's, it's quite short. Here we see like a general algorithm of signing and verification of signatures. Um, initial data, it's a document or message or whatever, or transaction, uh, they are hashed. The result is encrypted with uh, private key and attached to the data. <coughs> and during verification, uh, recipient also does hashing of initial message receive hash and then decrypt <coughs> signature and compare it. That's all. If it's equal, then signature is valid. Okay, it was supposed to be a small break, but I think we are fine. Okay, mess. We'll uh, review some concepts. I still need paper. <laughs> Okay, oh. how actually encryption works? Um, we can s see an encryption as a combination of the message and the key. It's theoretically impossible to decipher some cipher text if length of the key is equal to the length of the message. Even theoretically impossible. If key is shorter than the message, <coughs> it's, it's still possible. But it's very, very hard. So all cryptographic systems that are used now, they are like computational, um, they are computationally impossible to break. But theoretically, like in 100 years, your Bitcoin wallets, if you, if you lose your money now, somebody can come and retrieve it. So, be the first when you know it. <laughs> um, so, block encryption um, uses two operations. It's like confusion and diff diffusion. 
it actually means that every symbol of a key uh, should affect every symbol of a letter, of an initial message. Ideally, if like if you change one letter of initial messages of initial message, all symbols of a ciphertext are changed. And vice versa, if you change one bit of a key, all symbols are changed of ciphertext. That's what cryptographers want to achieve when they develop ciphers. And usually like a few very simple operations are used to encrypt. Um, it's mixing columns, it's um, substitute values, uh, and it's addition with some known matrix, plus, plus addition with a key. So in this operation uh, continues like 30, 50 times per each block of information. Okay, it, that was the part about encryption, encryption, symmetrical encryption. And uh, in Bitcoin we use actually a symmetrical encryption when keys are different. So I want to give you some idea how actually um, a symmetric algorithm, algorithms work. It's mostly about finite sets of elements. So imagine uh, some like, group of elements, numbers, that um, have an operation like multiple. And uh, it requires associativity. Uh, it has, this group has identity, um, unique element, which is one and uh, it has inversity in it. So for every element you have an inverse element. And this group, if it's finite, so number of its elements is finite, it could be used for uh, cryptography operations. So imagine that um, it's better to explain it on the paper, so if somebody wants to understand more, so come to me after the presentation and explain. Imagine that you have a set of seven elements uh, from one, like zero, one, two, three, four, five, six. If you add one to six, you receive seven, but it's like cycled. So seven means zero, eight means one, nine means two, so it's cycled, it's finished. In this uh, mathematical structure, uh, you can make an operation and receive the same number in, in the result. So uh, it's modular arithmetic. So uh, for like any integer which is bigger than one, operation x mod n, it means that you have to find a remainder of x divided by n. <coughs> and uh, there are some laws, mathematical laws, that ensure that every integer if it's put into the, some square, it could be equal to one. So it's cycle. There is possible, this is example of RSA uh, encryption scheme. So you can set two numbers which are mathematically connected and say that this number is encryption key, this number is decryption key, and then send Okay, encryption key public key. They send public key to the public. So any anybody can send you a message just <coughs> put in, into the, this uh, square. 
And the encryption operation will be very similar, just multiply, put in the square, and you receive the message. That's because it's all finite fields. So all asymmetric cryptography works in the finite fields. You have heard probably of about elliptic curves. That's also a group of points on some mathematical curve. And it's the, the only difference, like the only in concept, that uh, is harder to operate with these <coughs> elements. So decryption is harder, so you can have shorter keys. For example, for symmetric encryption, your key could be 128 bits. For RSA algorithm, it should be not less than 2,000. 40, uh, 48 uh, bits. For uh, elliptic curve, it would be like 3,000, 300 bits, 200 bits. So it's just more complex operations. And every time, yeah, it will be new um, mass problems, new mass uh, structures, but they will all work in uh, finite fields, finite groups, to ensure that. Um, one wave function is exist and it's hard to solve. Okay, that's actually all that I want to say. If you have questions about mess, I will like sit and explain you on the paper. Thank you. Thank you. about Bitcoin. Uh, I have a question. Could you go back to the elliptical curve? Um, so I guess why is that there for Bitcoin? Um, the last slide you have was about the elliptical curve as an example. Why is that good for Bitcoin versus any of the other types of algorithms? That why it's used in Bitcoin? Yeah. Why is it good for Bitcoin? It's standard for cryptography because keys uh, using this Bitcoin, oh, using this elliptic curve. Sorry about that. Okay, I can, I can <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> the only advantage of elliptic curves, basically, is that cryptography is stronger on, on it, so you can have shorter keys. Shorter keys means shorter messages, shorter signatures. You know that the public ledger on a Bitcoin is very big. Imagine it could be like four times bigger if we, if, uh, we used RSA for signing messages. So just amount of information. Do we trade off security for that or? Um, it's, you always can select the space um, needed amount, needed space. Uh, to ensure the same level of security, you just one, um, one committee uh, should have this length of key. Another primitive, this one's of key. So you don't trade, you, you, you select, you select this. Got it. Thank Ensure you. Ensure specific levels. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, so uh, you mentioned like a couple of different uh, concepts like hashing and signal mm -hmm. signatures and encryption. Uh, so is it Bitcoin just encryption at all? Um, <coughs> actually, Indirect protocol, not, but uh, it should use in some operations when you need. Okay, if you have an SSL connection to the server, you will use encryption. So that's it's not directly. It was. It's not directly in Bitcoin. Yeah. yeah. Actually, there is a concept. Uh, nobody encrypt uh, information on a symmetric key, initially symmetric key generated and distributed using a symmetric cryptography and then used only symmetric key. So, because it's like a million times faster to, to encrypt on a symmetric cryptography. Are there any weaknesses with elliptical curve cryptography with like, uh, I've heard some people talk about quantum computers, there's weaknesses associated with that. Is that 
yeah, in software it always can be some vulnerabilities. Um, you have to select the right elliptic curve because there are some elliptic curves that are not suitable for cryptography. Or like they're suitable, but um, it's much easier to uh, reduce it to like normal mathematical structures. It's super singular curves, so you can transmit. So you can transmit match its points to like to normal fields. Uh, you can target target to a place that's weaker. Yeah, and also. Uh, there are some flaws. So in every finite group, uh, you can select element uh, which has the maximum order, maximum, and you can find an element that has small order, like three, four, five. So your key space will be like three elements. There are some attacks on it. So it's all about implementation. Usually. So. This might, this is a separate question. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if this is too deep into the Bitcoin protocol, but do you have an understanding as to why um, addresses are not the public keys, that they're, they're a hash result of the public keys? Is the, motiva the cryptographic motivation or information security motivation for that? Actually, actually not. You mm -hmm. might have if you, the reason you shouldn't reuse keys is because it's a hash of the public key, right? Okay. So yeah. what happens is, is if there's a break in the CDSA, um, what that implies is you have to first break the hash function if the key is never been used, right? So if you've never used a key before, they only really have a <coughs> and then they have to spend you because it's a hash, right? If it's, if it's never been spent, then they don't know what the public key is. Yeah, they, they thought so, but to break ECDSA, it's like, it's not our future. It's maybe our successors in like 1,100 years, 1,000 years. Of, yeah, do, if it's but never been said, you can't, you can't break it. Yeah, right. right. Yeah. Because it's a hash. If I understand correctly, uh, quantum computers might have some effect on the security of ECDSA, but they shouldn't be able to break hashing function itself. So I think it gives some level of security against the uh, quantum computers that you create them at some point. Yeah, if you never release your key because it's, uh, usually your key is somehow expressed on the internet. So. Yeah, quantum computers is not the nearest future. It's like yeah. decades, maybe more. Maybe Bitcoin will die <laughs> I have a question about man in the middle attacks. You talked about man in the middle attacks for merchants. How does a merchant detect whether they are a victim of a man in the middle of attack? They you just know? don't receive money for the transaction. <laughs> <laughs> done. Done. <laughs> yeah, how to prevent? That's quite easy. Uh, you have to certify your public key. Right. right. That's all. But I, I haven't seen any cases. Yeah? So you were talking about the key distribution earlier and you didn't mention the work of trust concept. I'm wondering what you think about that and why it isn't still working in practice because the concept is great I think but yeah. I don't know, it seems like it didn't really work out as uh, something that's used commonly. Did you, did you hear him? No. Yes, no, yes. No. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> was it actually a question? Or? He's going to ask him. Well, He's going to ask him louder. Go ahead. So I was asking, you mentioned uh, key, key distribution earlier. Uh, and uh, the web of trust concept. <laughs> Web of trust? Get closer, get closer. Come on, guys. Yeah, web of trust. Yeah, web of trust. Key distribution. You mentioned earlier a few methods for distributing keys using like 
Ah, and trust party, yeah. Yeah, but the in Bitcoin, no. No, not in Bitcoin in general. I mean, it could open the supply to Bitcoin, but. Yeah, it could be applied. Uh, could we get partial again? So we can all compare it. <laughs> Just yeah, it's understood the question that uh, the short party is not very deep, deeply involved in a distribution of keys, right? Uh, so it's true for bitcoins, for cryptocurrencies, but in the banking system, they created this level of trust. Uh, and uh, yeah, in my country, every government organization uh, has own public infrastructure, own level of trust. So I'm a entrepreneur, I have my private key, I can sign transactions to the bank, I can sign tax, tax documents, I can sign some other documents. So, uh, but yeah, in cryptocurrency, it's, it should be some, like somebody has to come and do it, to create this actually infrastructure over Got a question over there. You mentioned a couple of things. Louder. No. You mentioned a couple of things. One, there was an assumption that the Yao function that there's not going to be hardware the <coughs> access to memory, which is a fundamental flawed assumption. You just assume that they are. And secondarily, you mentioned about the subscription for like this would be strong and you build sort of stuff or stuff tested. And we know those of us who work in security. Again, there's a lot of stuff in the it's back, and they have people are saying, right? And that's why people really want those to be used 10 years ago, because like, two plus both was much higher. The issue is now people are using files and VMs to accelerate memory, to crack memory these tools. So because they can do stuff in 5 to microseconds, it rewrites our calculation on SSD. They can actually do accelerate 50 or 100 right. That's yeah, my question. Yeah, I, I get so it. So, how do you really get real security? What is your view of what's the next step? Yes, there is no real security. It's always. Uh, it's, always about trust. it's Yeah, it's about trust. So, you have to trust your hardware provider. We know that Intel has some flaws into processors. We know that other companies did the same, like Huawei recently was found that NSA installed some indoors. Yeah, the man in the middle of desk has it. Yeah, yeah. So um, it's a level of trust. But for a normal attacker, he, can, he cannot go into the into yeah, your hardware. So it assumes that uh, you control at least something. You control your memory when you encrypt messages. Uh, but yeah, there is no 100% security at all anywhere. And uh, second question, yeah, you're right. Uh, some old algorithms, which were public as well, they were broken, uh, but it doesn't eliminate the fact that like, hidden algorithms, they were broken much faster. Because less people, less <coughs> crypto analytics analyze it. So that's it's common practice. That don't invent new cryptography. Or if you invent it, don't use it. <laughs> yeah, it could be some exceptions, but yeah. You're it's not always. <laughs> <laughs> All right, last question. That's why you. Last question. Hit me. What's the state of uh, homomorphic encryption right now? <laughs> 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 I don't see anyone. Oh. Read recently. It's still in development. It's what closed source. The what's, the, what's the state? What's the state of homo, homo, homomorphic encryption? Yeah, it, I mean, it's closed source. It's not really been been made open source. And the professor from Israel, um, he's supposed to present on it, but I mean, it's still vaporware in terms of what I've heard so far. And that's as of February of this year. There, we don't know what it is. I mean, the, the hope is that you can 
encrypt while running the algorithm so that you can actually have a system make a computation of it, encrypt it, and the output of that computation will be the, 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 the result you expected, right? So we can encrypt while making computations, which is what we can't do now, right? So that is the promise of you know, homomorphic encryption. Still a dream. Yeah, I mean, like, it, it relies on, like, his last public implementation relied on um, the person that created it, mm -hmm. like, throwing away the random number. It's like, okay, I'm going to use it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. would, would that method basically make, uh, like, RAM attacks more resistant? Or that is, really a, that is a goal, like, you can have totally decentralized, trustless, like, you know, full-on trading systems okay. where, you know, you can't see what's going on, but, you know, you're getting the expected computations you desire. All right, uh, can we go home now? <laughs>